Hi, I'm Satri. This is my article's presentation for our diversity and multicultural perspective class, and I'm going to present two articles. The first article is on multicultural meanings of social support among immigrants and refugees by Stewart et al. 2008. This article is focused on Canada as the setting, which is one of the legal immigrants receiving countries. One of the major issues in this article is the impact of different cultures among immigrants and refugees on social support in terms of needs, seeking and receiving behavior, and strategies to provide those supports. This article aimed to answer questions about challenges experienced by immigrants and refugees how they define social support, what methods they use to seek social support, how immigrants and refugees from different countries, specifically in this article, those from China and Somali, differ in their way to get social support, and what mechanism they recommend should be applied to support them. The first basic foundation for the discussion reviewed in this article is the development of program and policy context for immigrants and refugees in Canada, specifically changed in policy between 1960s up until 2001 that covered issues around education level of the immigrants and refugees, effects of economic situation in Canada, skills and financial status of immigrants and refugees, and immigration policy. The second is social support in cultural contexts that included effects on emotional problems with integration, networking, conflicting values within families, timing of immigration, and other factors such as locus of control. So, based on individual interviews with service providers, policymakers, immigrants and refugees, challenges experienced by immigrants and refugees are language difficulties, especially for adult learners, barriers to obtaining employment due to non-recognition of foreign qualifications, insufficient information for navigating the system in the host country, disruptive family dynamics, inadequate childcare, lack of immigration status, expectations versus reality, and discrimination, which is mainly racial. In the meantime, immigrants and refugees define social support as any help or assistance, either formal support from Canadian government or informal support from friends and family, and in more holistic way, their definition included, fi included financial, psychological, and moral support. Some of ways that the immigrants and refugees use to seek social support are by seeking it from families and ethnocultural communities, seeking for informational support from peers first, and then to professional or other ethnic-specific organizations. And many also try to widen and strengthen their social networks to be more exposed to information and ideas. While the Somali community in Canada is small and has a limited network resources, only by being focused, goal-oriented, hardworking, and maintaining good social network, they could get necessary support, which is different from China immigrants who maintain social networks in their homeland. They also tend to be self-reliant, and they also perceived support seeking, support seeking to be a shame. So, for the last research question about mechanism, the research participants recommended that governments allocate more resources to disadvantage, disadvantaged communities, accept foreign qualifications, create employment programs, expedite immigration process, and enable access to supports. This second article is a report on education and training policy aiming at no more failures by applying the 10 steps to equity in education. Equity in education means two important dimensions, which are fairness and inclusion. Fairness in terms of personal and social circumstances and inclusion in terms of basic minimum standard of education for all. Why equity in education matters? Well, because one, there is a human right imperative for people to be able to develop their capacities and participate fully in society. 
and one is through education. And two, the long-term social and financial cost of educational failure are high. And three, increased immigration poses new challenges for social cohesion in some countries, while other countries face long-standing issues of integrating minorities. This report focused on issues highlighted as important equity challenges, which are equity in compulsory education, early school leaving, different educational pathways and how they might be having an impact on equity, and integration of migrants and minorities in the education system. Here are some of what studies said about equity in education. Education enhances life chances of individuals that include employment opportunities and non-economic outcomes such as good health, etc. Equity in education supports social equity just like it enhances life chances. Unequal results in education have heavy costs. School failures and dropouts are more at risk of benefit dependency, juvenile delinquency, and the associated cost to society. Public expenditure on education reduces initial income differences. Equity is widely seen as one of the basic necessities of life and the right to education is recognized. And a recent World Bank report argued that equity and efficiency are in fact complementary in economic development, which means there is no contradiction between equity and efficiency in education. So here are the 10 steps that summarize policy recommendations for equity in education based on this report. Step one is limit early tracking and streaming and postpone academic selection. This is based on evidences that secondary school systems with large differences between schools tend to have worse results in math and reading. And academic selection by school system is associated with great social differences between schools, especially of socioeconomic performance. And evidences from research and studies suggest that early tracking is associated with reduced equity in outcomes and sometimes weakens results overall. Step two is manage school choices so as to contain the risk to equity. This is based on evidences that school choice may pose risk to equity since well-educated parents may make shrewder choices and that across countries, greater choice in school system is associated with larger differences in the social composition of different schools. Step three, in upper secondary education, provide attractive alternatives, remove dead ends and prevent dropout. This is based on evidences that between 5% and 40% of students drop out of school in all OECD countries. Dropout mainly stems from disenchantment with school, lack of support at home, negative learning experiences, and repeating years. Early identification of students at risk helps to improve outcomes and prevent dropout. And good career guidance and counseling combined with a more flexible and diverse, and diverse curriculum help to reduce dropout rates. Step four, offer second chances to gain from education. This is based on evidences that those who fail at school often find it difficult to recover later on and that across all OECD countries, many adults and young dropouts without basic education obtain school qualifications through second chance programs. Step five, identify and provide a systematic help to those who fall behind at school and reduce high rates of school year repetition. This is based on evidences that in, so, in some school systems, up to one quarter of students repeat a year at some point. And although year repetition is often popular with teachers, there is little evidence that children gain benefit from it. And the classroom is the first level of intervention, intervention for equity. Reading recovery strategies can help many poor readers to catch up and that Finland uses a hierarchy of successive formal and informal interventions to assist those falling behind at school.
Step 6. Strengthen the links between school and home to help disadvantaged parents help their children to learn. This is based on evidences that, on average, children in OECD countries spend more than 20% of their total learning time out of school, such as doing homework, etc. Home factors, including parental support for education, engagement with children's learning and cultural cultural assets are associated with stronger school performance. While homework can improve school outcomes, but reliance on homework may also threaten equity due to the lack of home support for some children. And parental involvement, such as working with children at home and actively participating in their school activities, does improve results. Step 7. Respond to diversity and provide for the successful inclusion of migrants and minorities within mainstream education. This is based on evidences that success in both education and employment varies widely between immigrant and minority groups and between different countries. Minority groups in many cases are less likely than others to participate in early childhood education and care more likely to be in special education and more likely to drop out. For some visible minority groups, labor market discrimination is sometimes extensive, and in most countries, immigrant students of first and second generation tend to perform less well than their native counterparts in the PISA assessments of math, science, and reading. Analysis suggests that much but not all of this is explained by social background factors. Step 8. Provide strong education for all, giving priority to early childhood provision and basic schooling. This is based on evidences that public provision of education can foster equity when it counterbalances poor home circumstances at the outset of children's lives. Education expenditure is shifting between sectors in many countries. Good quality, affordable early childhood education and care has large long-term benefits, particularly for disadvantaged children. And grants to poor families for school-age children may reduce dropout at upper secondary level. Step 9. Direct resources to students and regions with the greatest needs. This is based on evidences that within countries, regional autonomy in spending may cause disparities in the level of provision unless it is balanced by mechanisms to redistribute resources to poorer regions. Many countries have special schemes to direct additional resources to schools or school areas serving disadvantaged pupils. And in many countries, less experienced teachers are working in difficult schools. And finally, step 10, set concrete targets for more equity, particularly related to law school attainment and dropout. This is based on evidences that numerical target can be a useful policy lever for equity in education by articulating policy in terms of what is to be achieved rather than in terms of formal processes or laws. International comparisons with the best performing countries suggest that some countries could significantly reduce the number of dropouts and student falling to acquire basic skills. National testing of individual student performance on basic skills is a fundamental tool to measure both individual performance and the performance of elements of the education system. And uh, many countries believe that the publication of results at school level is desirable or politically and legally inevitable. That's all about the two articles. I personally found both of them very insightful and enlightening in many ways, especially as guidances for our efforts to make the world a better place to live in. Thank you.